Rough Trade is giving away a third of the first three months of the Rough Trade Club plus new music membership exclusively to 101 Part-Time Jobs listeners. Become a member of Rough Trade Club New Music and you'll receive the Rough Trade Album of the Month straight to your door every month on an exclusive vinyl pressing with bonus material. Club members have received exclusive pressings of albums from Sufjan Stevens, Sprints, The Last Dinner Party, English Teacher and Over Mono, just to name a few, this past year alone. Sign up using the promo code CLUB101POD and you'll get Rough Trade's Album of the Month, Camera Obscura's Look to the East, Look to the West, for a third of the usual price. By signing up, you'll be getting Rough Trade's exclusive issue of the album on opaque purple in a gatefold sleeve plus a bonus CD containing five demos. Don't want the album of the month but still want all the benefits? Sign up to the standard tier using Club 101 Pod and you'll still get the first month free. You'll also get free shipping on all orders, 10% off at the bar and on secondhand vinyl in store and exclusive access to sold out Rough Trade events. So don't hang around. Head to roughtrade.com slash club and sign up with the code Club 101 Pod. That's Club 101 P-O-D and claim money Money off Rough Trade's album of the month today. This offer is for UK residents only. Do you play in bands? I did for the longest time. And I wish that I knew the Distro Kid was a thing. I don't even think it existed back then. Distro Kid makes music distribution fun and easy with unlimited uploads and artists keep 100% of your royalties and earnings. A million plus artists rely on DistroKid to get their music on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, TikTok, Tidal, Instagram, and all the major streaming services. When you get DistroKid, you can see a DistroKid bank and withdraw your earnings. You get notified when you've earned royalties and you can withdraw via the app. And you can even check your streaming stats on Spotify. Spotify and Apple. Get 30% off your first year on DistroKid by going to distrokid.com slash VIP slash 101 pod. 30% off for your first year. That's not bad. We know it's a tough world out there. Why don't you make it easier for yourself? And to get 30% off that free year as an artist where you get 100% of your royalties and earnings, go to distrokid.com slash VIP slash 101 pod. All right, stay with me. I'll be right back after this. You're listening to 101 Part-Time Jobs with me, Giles Bidder. It's where we hear from artists and bands about all the side hustles that come alongside being an artist now. No longer are the days where it's held behind the red curtain and pop stars are out of sight. They're on our screens now. That's one of their jobs, being on an Instagram and TikTok. They have to do loads of things now that they never had to do. And this is the place where we get to hear all about that and people's attitudes how musicians are changing with the times it is completely absurd to say that today is the 350th episode of the podcast we've done some little side bits here along the way but i'm pretty sure this is the 350th episode i've probably labeled a few of the numbers wrong over the four years that we've been doing this and it's with a delight that it's with suggs from madness an absolute legend madness's latest album theater of the absurd presents say la vie was their first album to go to to number one in the UK charts which is kind of mad to think of apparently the rest went to number two and number three uh, Suggs was saying to Claudia Winkleman and from Claudia Winkleman Suggs gets to chat with me he was out and about in Soho when we spoke so there's a bit of a din a bit of a crowd noise throughout this episode but really it's a bit like I'm taking you to the pub with Suggs it's like you're hanging out down the pub 
with Suggs yourself. You're there with him. This number one album, Theatre of the Absurd, presents C'est La Vie, has now got an enhanced edition. That's coming out on the 7th of June and it includes five new studio tracks and seven live recordings. So there's enough in there to part ways with the money and get the new record. That's out on the 7th of June and they're going on tour as well. June and July, they're going to be all across the UK on tour from Margate to Lincoln to Derby to Belfast and Galway. Madness on tour this summer. You can get tickets from their website, madness.co.uk. Cheers for listening. If you've stuck around with this podcast for any longer than a few episodes, thank you so much. I love doing these episodes. We put out two every week. We have all sorts of bands on from idols to self-esteem we've had yard act and king gizzard and the lizard wizard bell and sebastian loads of excellent people have come through these doors you can go back and listen to them there's enough of them and thank you for being here if you're able to subscribe to the show if you're listening on apple or spotify that would be massively appreciated and if you've got 30 seconds to leave a review uh, about what we're doing here there there's two articles in the guardian that just came out about how musicians are finding it harder and harder to live that's a huge part of the conversation of 101 part-time jobs because everyone's having to work a million jobs just to get by that's the world we live in now and i don't really want to go through it without getting stories without getting people's real life accounts so there's a reason that we do this thanks to 2000 trees our unwavering sponsors down in cheltenham it's a brilliant independent festival this year the gaslight anthem don broco and the chats are headlining manchester orchestra bob villain creeper Hot Milk, Skinny Lister, loads of brilliant bands from rock to punk to ska to to folk. 2000 Trees in Cheltenham. You can get 50 quid off your ticket by using the voucher code 101POD at checkout. Head to 2000trees.co.uk to pick up those tickets. All right, in a second, we'll be with Suggs down in Soho on 101 Part-Time Jobs. Are you in Soho? I say Quo Vardis, do you know that? On Dean Street. All oh, right. It's a nice spot to watch the world go by, yeah. My mum lived and worked here in bars and she was a jazz singer, so I was brought up. I mean, I was, you know, in a pram outside the French house. <laughs> My earliest recollection of being around here. That's funny. Um, but that was a tremendous time, you know, the 70s, 80s. It, it, it was just the end of the licensing laws. You know, the pubs used to shut up three and didn't open again until 5.30. So a lot of these so supposedly called members clubs opened up. There were probably about 30 of them. They're just dingy old basements, you know what I mean? <laughs> Full of fag smoke and and whatever. Yeah, no, there's the one called the Kismet, which was just fantastic because it certainly wasn't. The only allusion to the Kismet was that it had stars and moons cut out of a cardboard ceiling. Mm-hmm. But I remember a, a, a great story of George Melly, the jazz singer, who took his friend down there at four o'clock in the afternoon and his friend said, Jesus, George, what's that smell? He said, failure, dear boy. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what kind of London was like around that time. It, it makes sense to someone who's, um, you know, of, of the kind of generation below growing up with madness and growing up with the kind of sounds of that time is that it, when you hear these stories, it makes sense to me. It's like you had something to celebrate. You know, the world was becoming a bit more colourful, more fun. Yeah. You could be a bit yeah. naughtier. Yeah. Very true, very true. I mean, it, it, we made a film in 1979, and, and, and it was, it, it didn't even tend it to be. We filmed it in colour, but it came out black and white. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was black and white. <laughs> and then colour came, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it was a fantastic experience for me as a, as a, as a young man. Like the Colony, which is where Francis Bacon and Lucy Freud and all of those cats from that time. It was so colourful, so full of fantastic vocabulary and fun, you know, and, and bridal joy. I mean, a lot of alcoholism as well, of course, but that was all in the firmament. Yeah. Now, there was a famous poet who said, be careful, Soho is a very dangerous place. He said, I don't mean guns and knives. I mean, I mean, Sohoitis. And if you catch it, it'll never work again. <laughs> well, the reason I do this podcast, 101 Part Time yes. Jobs, is because most people now playing music 
are working other jobs to sustain it. You know, that kind of idea. Yeah. But there's also this idea that I want to talk about, which is like employment, it makes you who you are. You know, the, the jobs that you yeah. have when you're younger, that instills in you an idea that you then put into your music or you, you put into the business of the music. Very true, very, very true. I mean, most of our songs are observational or, 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 or all related to our own lives. And yeah, you listen to those first couple of albums, they're all full of odd job men songs and yeah. getting your first car and all that. Yeah. Um, yeah, very true, very true. I mean, not going to start getting into the money syndrome, but no. there was also a great deal of opportunity then. You know, in Camden Town, where we started out, there were five, six, seven pubs where you could get a gig, and pretty much all of them have gone. So mm. there was a much greater chance of just being able to keep yourself afloat with a part-time job and get the band going, you know, two or three nights a week. Mm -hmm. But those two things were in parallel for sure, yeah. And being on the dole, so many great bands were on the dole. On the jam roll. <laughs> and it, I didn't have the wherewithal to um to get on that. <laughs> but um I just kept myself going, you know, with cash in the end jobs, you know, they just and the other thing was you could just you know, I bored of that, you could go over the road and get another job and then you get stacked off that and it just went on and on. What were your most memorable jobs from that time? Well, the first one was um, a butcher's. I used to work there in the summer holidays. And then I sort of stopped going to school when I was about 14 or 15. And they offered me a job as an apprentice, which I took. But it's like a really weird situation. An apprenticeship in a butcher's is like a bit like being on a ship. It's got a really strict hierarchy, man. You've got the boss, right? <laughs> Mr. Mannering. Uh, it was a big red face. It was a sort of, in the butcher's charter, wasn't it? You have to have a big red face, big red hands. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the master butcher who did all the sort of proper cutting. Then it went down and I was right at the bottom. I was the one, you know, fishing hairy hamburgers out of the cabinet at the front and carrying great big carcasses off the lorry. <laughs> and in fact, there was a thing called butcher's slang, which really ain't that sophisticated. It's basically just words backwards. <laughs> So it took me a while to realise my name was Yuzel. And it was a little while before I realised it was just lazy backwards. But I didn't last I didn't last very long there. I used to sort of I'd get a bit knackered, you know, and then I'd sneak upstairs to the upstairs toilet, lock the door and try and have a snooze on the toilet seat but I got caught doing that one once too many times but it was a, it was a lovely you know again you know the good outweighs the bad I mean at Christmas it was at the Angel in Chapel Street Market which was just like it was like something out of Dickens you know what I mean and it was all people with Christmas hats on and it was all sparkling and beautiful the other great thing about that life was it started about six in the morning at midday everyone was in the pub yeah and um, as an underage drinker, I was in, the, you know, slipping between the rest of them. And then I remember the manager of the pub would always have a bottle of port on the counter for the customers at Christmas. But he'd drunk most of it himself before the doors were open. <laughs> the thing I love about these kinds of stories is that they're around people. They're around communities yeah. and characters. Yeah. And I feel like um, so you got to. I, I feel like in my life, I got to hold on to those characters in my life. You know, I kind of look for those kind yeah. of characters. That's what entertains me. That's what makes me happy. Yeah, and I, you know, uh, I totally agree. And and it's kind of sad because a lot of that continuity goes as time goes on. And I assume that happens for every every generation. You know, mm. but you do have the memories of these characters very clearly in my mind. I can see them all. You know. Yeah. And there were some of the apprentices that were really like, you know, serious, you know, it was like, it was, it was their lives, the slipping butcher's job. I was just sticking pork chops in my pocket on the way home. That was my life. <laughs> so have, you, have you sort of brought that idea of people and community and maybe even like hierarchy to, to your life in music? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you think of baggy trousers, that was all about teachers and our relationship with kids and adults. Um, 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 One Better Day is a song I wrote about um, a huge uh, homeless hostel in um, Camden Town. Mm. 
And what was interesting about that was it was it was people who sort of dropped out of society for one reason or another. I met the I met the guy who ran it actually, Jim, and the amazing thing was he said people put it down to drink, but he said eighty percent of the blokes in here are there because they had broken relationships which is a sort of surprise. But you'd see them walking down the road in like undertaker's outfits and naval uniforms, you know, the gear they dropped out in. Um, and I, I, I wrote one better day because people used to go, he's seen better days. And I used to think, well, let's hope he sees one more better day. <laughs> but I can't think offhand, but I think a lot of our songs were affected by that. Um, Certainly wrote songs about working uh, uh, part-time jobs. Yeah, yeah. But, and, and your attitude. Anyway, didn't not your attitude towards song. being in a band. You know, your own discipline. Because I suppose at one, at some point in your life, you know, you were the person deciding what time you were waking up in the morning. Very true. Yeah, and that's a very good point because we were just a bunch of friends, and then a couple of the bands started to take it seriously. But I didn't really. You know, I, I, I had no intention of being a singer. It was complete coincidence that they asked me because I was quite. Sort of charming or whatever, um, uh, and 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 then what, the biggest day of rehearsing was on Saturdays, and I used to go to the football. I was a big Chelsea fan, and I started running out of excuses like, "Oh, my aunt died," or "My cat needs to go to the vet," or and then unfortunately, I appeared on that uh, edition of Match of the Day. You could see me at the front of the shed like that. So the game was up, and I got sacked. And I only found out because there was an advert in the back of the Melody Maker, which was a music paper in those days, yeah. that, that, that said, that, that said semi-professional North London bands yeah. seek professionally minded singer. And when I looked, I saw it was our keyboard player, Mike's phone number, and I thought, what's going on here? So I phoned him up and I put on a posh voice and I said, hello, yes, I'm just inquiring about the job of singer. I said, just out of interest, what's happened to the old one? They said, oh, we've had to let him go. He's not taking it seriously enough. I said, you bastards. It's me. And Mike said, oh, Suggs. Yeah, mate, sorry, I meant to tell you. But listen, we could do with you back in the band. I said, oh, yeah. He said, yeah, playing drums. I said, playing drums. I said, what's happened to John? He said, oh, he's auditioning for singer. I said, you can stuff yourself. You can stuff it. Anyway, there I am. Playing drums in my bedroom, very badly. But no, that was a real turning point in answer to your original question, where I realised I went. They played at a school in Camden, and there were all these girls screaming down at the front, and I just suddenly realised this is starting to go somewhere, and I should be up there and not down here. <laughs> Unfortunately, the singer they had went away, and I was the only one who knew the song, so they didn't want to. But they had to ask me back. And that was the moment when I realised, yeah, that I have to turn up to rehearsals and I have to be responsible for my own involvement yeah. in this band, absolutely. Yeah, and that's the start of your career. That was the start of being like, okay, yeah. it starts and ends with you. Exactly, exactly. And the rewards you get therein, you know. I mean, I didn't really understand what, what, where we were going or how we were going to do it, but Mike and a couple of the others did. And just I remember Mike saying, look, there's not many young bands around. This was... You know, the sort of height of every rock and Pink Floyd and all these old dinosaurs. So, and we just kept plugging away, you know. Everybody wanted to be in a band, but not many of them had any sort of real dedication to the process of practicing and doing pubs, you know, practicing, playing in pubs, practicing. And just bit by bit, we started to get somewhere. And we got a residency at a pub in Camden called the Dublin Castle on a Wednesday night. And it just meant we could start to build some sort of a following, which really was the turning point of our career. We hear about stories of the process, like quite often, you know, growing up reading the enemy and Kerrang and that, you know, I'd read about the starts of bands and how it started. But what you don't really hear stories of, about is when people get to a certain level of success about how to then a be in a good place spiritually and sonically and all that but also be like okay how do we how do we keep this going you know without knowing that everything is going to be a peak you know you're going to kind of exciting times yeah, happen yeah. in a flash but then how do you keep that up how do you keep it going 
which is something that you're very true. you've done. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, that is back to a sort of oldie worldy thing of, you know, we were sort of out of some mould like the 60s where we were playing gigs three nights a week, rehearsing, playing. So for two or three years, we did all what you call your Jews or whatever they call it, you know. So by the time we were sort of getting properly going, we were pretty good. And it sort of was, but you know, like you say, you know, you get a gig and you think, well, that's it. If I never do anything else, at least I can say I did a, a gig. You make your first single and think, well, if nothing else, I've done that. Mm. And it's just sort of incremental. But it happened quite fast for us because we made a single with the two-tone label and went on tour with the specials and select. And it was just like a rocket, you know, it just went off over about eight months. And then Stiff Records came along, which was full of all the people that we loved. Mm. Elvis Costello, Ian Jury, yeah. Dan, Kirsten McCall. It was just the perfect place for us. And the, the owner of that label had really good um, energy. And, and we were just putting out records like every three weeks. One Step Beyond, you know, Embarrassment, House of Fun. And we were just having it after it. It was suddenly this whirlwind, you know, which didn't give us a chance to say, think what you were talking about because we were just churning them out. But by about 1985, our keyboard player was doing quite a lot of the writing and got a bit tired and, in fact, married this Dutch girl and said, I've actually had enough, which was like a huge shock to everyone. But probably the best thing that happened to us because then we broke up for about five years and didn't have to think about that pressure. You know what I mean? At the level that we got to, mm. we all just went back to doing our jobs, my friend, <laughs> which was great and back to the real world. Yeah. And then when we came back in 1992, you know, it was like a real, right, what do we want to do this time? Not what we're being told to do or being pressurized to do or worrying about. Mm. Just do it when we want to do it and enjoy it, which is how it became. Yeah. What were you getting up to? But funny enough, back to Sorry, you go. Well, funny enough, back to the old job business. You reminded me there about, you know, what makes a band and all that. Because we were friends from where we lived, Kentish Town, Camden Town. And um, we were often in collusion with these stupid odd jobs. We got hold of two Morris Thousand vans, which are old, old, old GPO vans for those younger viewers. And um, we used to go to gigs in. But during the day, we'd like, okay, my mate said we could get a job gardening. So we stole a lawnmower and headed off down to the depot. And um, um, my uh, apprenticeship was the geezer said, look, there's a bed of flowers and weeds. Go and pull out some weeds. So complete chance, I just pulled out things that I thought didn't look like them flowers and got the job. <laughs> but that didn't last long either. Yeah, I mean, it's a long story, which I won't bore you with, but it culminated in we were given more and more sophisticated jobs, which we just didn't know how to do. And this was with Michael Kiebelberg. And um, we were asked to plant six pine trees outside this mansion block in St. John's Wood. And as I've said before, do you realise how big a hole you have to dig? Dig for the root ball of a tree, right? Really big. And after the first hole, we had a kid that night, and I thought we'd get, get our skates on. I thought, right, bollocks to this. So I took the executive decision just to saw off the root ball and stick the trunk of the tree between two bricks and hope for the best. <laughs> Being a you're a black. I remember, <laughs> and we ran for our lives. I remember going past a few weeks later and all the trees were going like that, all brown and dead, all falling over. And that was the end of the gardening career. <laughs> I mean, but again, great times. You know, happy days on summer afternoons, you know, mowing lawns and all that. It was a nice time again, yeah. Yeah, and there's a good spirit of London in that. I think there's the, 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 London's got so much going on and to kind of be able to run around. London can feel like a big playground on a sunny, sunny day. And those are the kind of things you get up to, you know, to, to make the cash. Exactly, exactly. And then the our sax player at the other Morris Rouse and Van said, yeah, no, I don't want to worry about that. Mm. Painting and decorating. He's working for the council again, which was an absolute doddle. We turn up at eight o'clock. So long as you can make it clock in, you'll be gone by 11 down the cafe. But um, my first job, the foreman says to me, can you size that big wall over there? Now, this is a technical one for painters and decorators, right? So I found a tape measure, and I'm going like that. It's quite hard because it's a really wide wall. And for those in the know, 
sizing a wall. He's painting it with a certain kind of glue so that he could put wallpaper on it. So that was the end of me painting a decorating career. <laughs> then he says, no, no, no. So he says, all the money's in plaster. It. Loads of money. <laughs> Harry Infield. Well, after our first day, <laughs> there was more plaster on my head than there was on the ceiling. And I have this theory, right, that plastering doesn't actually exist. Has any human being actually seen a plasterer at work? No. All they do is, while you're out, paint the walls pink. <laughs> because wet substances do not stick to ceilings. You try troweling blancmange or jelly on a ceiling, see what happens. That's a very good point. Anyway, again, then again, that job was over and done with within a couple of days. But as I say, it went on and on and on and on. Yeah. On and on. yeah. And, and, and playing music, like music's always been there and you've had that time off between records and then like records like The Liberty of Norton Folgate and the new one, the one that just yeah. come out, Theatre of the Absurd presents yeah. C'est La Vie. It's like, do, do, you, do you put your, are you still in the same headspace now as you were back then, do you reckon? It's very hard to say, you know, because I think... It was great, and I mean, I, mean, I think it, it, it occurs in, in lots of bands, and if not most of them. The greatest work is when they start out. I mean, not all, obviously, Beatles, not, you know, they're not the greatest example of that. But, um, because the one thing you can't recapture is naivety, you know what I mean? And those early records capture that really energetic naivety where you're not really even thinking you're just jumping about you know mm -hmm. on sulfate but um so things like norton folgate obviously because i educated myself a bit because i wasn't really at school and I, I've, I've got more and more interested in history so then i'm writing songs that are slightly more evolved you know intellectually that's the word yeah <laughs> i mean but you know but what we always try to do is try and keep as much of the spirit you know not get too um profound or, or what's the word self-indulgent yeah. you know i mean still make pop songs but pop songs probably from a different perspective in terms of how old you are mm -hmm. yeah I often think, as I get, I've got a suspicion that getting older, I, you know, I want it to be fun. I've got a suspicion that I'm going to yeah. be a better adult than I was a kid. And being a kid was pretty fucking fun. And I feel like that's part of the yeah. job of life is to keep it fun, keep it exciting and do what you physically can, whether that's reading or finding a new, whatever it is. You know what I mean? But to keep trying, yes. I think trying is, is, is what it is. Yeah, totally true. Yeah, you know, you see people atrophying, you know, at my age, you know, I mean, and, and less to keep yourself stimulated and interesting and interested mm. very true very very true i mean things like that norton folgate took me a couple of years there's a bit like writing a novel but you know to do the research and really get something that i wanted to do across was, 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 was really involving and interesting mm -hmm. um and the same with the band you know to try and keep it stimulated i mean funny enough like you say there are advantages because you know, if you ask me about any of those early gigs, I couldn't remember a thing. It was just a lot of heads flying, hats flying in the air, arms going up and down, and it's just a blur because you're just in this adrenaline. And now when I play a gig, I really, really appreciate I've got the space in my mind to look at the audience, still enjoy it and, and be as energetic as I can, mm -hmm. but, but to actually appreciate, you know, what a great privilege it is to be in a band yeah. you know after all these years yeah. which is again very rewarding you know and we get that at gigs as well i mean uh, my aunt and my uncles we go to the same gigs we like a similar kind of music and yeah. there's a lot of british music especially from your from your from madness's early you know from your era yeah where you've kind of you, you you're you've got, done a bit of an austin powers you, you're you, you're in ice you know what i mean you're you're yeah. preserved forever I understand where you're coming from yeah i mean you know, we do concerts now, and I've actually been at one where we've had four generations, you know, granddad, mum, dad, and great-granddad do kids. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, people ask me, and I have no idea why that music still resonates, but, you know, God bless it. And, again, it's, it's something that I feel is a privilege because it doesn't happen to everybody, do you know what I mean? I mean, a lot of my contemporaries fell by the wayside, not wishing to big myself up too much, but we just keep going. I mean, it's like every year comes around and another massive tour. And our saxophone player said last year, I said, when can I retire? I said, they won't let us. They won't let us. They won't let us. Because you've never gone away. There's, there's that thing about madness no. that you've just never gone away. Suggs has never gone away. 
No, no. I don't know why. You know, I mean, I suppose because we had so many hits, that's a great start to yeah. longevity, I suppose. <laughs> but, um, but I think, you know, we've always only done the things we really want to do, you know, from the very beginning. Mm. I don't know. I hate the word, really. But I kind of, what? Well, like these podcasts, yeah, that I really wanted to do. <laughs> but no, I'm enjoying it now, seeing your lovely face. Um, <laughs> no, I like podcasts. It's all right. I think it's better than... Uh, than uh you know smashing a nice radio interviews but um yeah and i think so, yeah not authentic authenticity i don't really know if that's true but mm. i think you know something does resonate with the ordinary person in what we do because ultimately we are i mean never really tried to be anything else you know what i mean i think there's one thing about music and i think music fans are intelligent in this kind of intuitive way because yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, you can't fool them really for too. Yeah, for too long. That's right. It's got yeah. to be authentic. Yeah, if yeah. it's not authentic, you kind of yeah. know it. You get this weird feeling about it. It's, it's an interesting <laughs> yeah, idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're so true, and I hear records that people go on about, and it just just sounds like a computer gone bonkers. You know, it just goes in one ear and out the other mm -hmm. because it's just the sort of algorithm, isn't it? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Not naming names or, you know, as I say, slagging off my you know, contemporary musicians, my fellow artists. But um, the other thing I think also that we always had a great sense of, you know, the entertainment end of it. You know, sometimes we were castigated for being a bit too foolish, but on reflection, when those songs are analysed, they're actually very cleverly constructed pop songs. Mm -hmm. But we were also really interested in that, which was a new thing, which was the video, you know, MTV was this whole new thing. And yeah. we were just all extroverts, you know, and then the chance to dress up and mess around was totally, um, you know, impossible to avoid. <laughs> and I think our first incarnation ended when we ran out of things to dress up with. We'd been mushrooms, flowers, <laughs> coppers, cowboys, traffic wardens. <laughs> and... Um, but I think that, that, that sort of legacy resonates, you know what I mean, in terms of people thinking, do I want to, you know, we know we're going to be entertained. You know, some bands are really good musicians, some bands are really good entertainers, and we kind of sort of got into the middle of those two yeah. art forms, yeah, you know what I mean? Definitely. What, what other kind of writing have you done? Have you found yourself kind of working in different kind of formats or...? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote a couple of books, one about London, and then I wrote a, bi a biography, which um, yeah, I've got it here. I should have spent more. Sure, I, I should have spent more time on. That's <laughs> how, bloody how hard so? writing books. It's just really hard, man. That is just a different discipline. You know, when you've been used to just, you know, I mean, for me, a good day of writing a song is you might get two or three good lines, you know what I mean? And then the next day, and you might remember something you had from a few weeks ago, and then you piece it together. But sitting down with a blank piece of paper and thinking, I've got to write 2,000 words today. It's really hard work, really hard discipline. Yeah. And there's no, you know, there's no distraction. You can't talk to your mates or show it to them or yeah. say, have you got any ideas for this? It's just on your own, you know. Where were you writing it from? From, said from it, your bedroom? From my little office in my house, yeah, yeah. And then I went to Mexico for a couple of weeks. Uh, that, that was the wrong place to go in terms of trying to keep yourself to yourself. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, because it was, it was it said, you know, inspiration doesn't come easy. It comes with a big stick. And funny enough, I remember you know, O'Brien saying, she used to lock herself in a room with a bucket. And that was it, you know, with the sandwich. It wouldn't come out for six hours. Anyway, it was an you know, interesting process. Then I wrote a one-man show, which was, was relatively successful. And again, was a very interesting process. I mean, I wrote that with a friend. So at least there was this kind of, you know, bouncing off each other. And then uh, it was very interesting performing on my own after 40 years of having the six idiots around me. So um, that was quite challenging, you know, terrifying. But, but another, you know, like you said, to stimulate yourself and do things that are a bit challenging, and it was, you know, it really was um, stimulating. Are you still finding out about yourself? Are you still learning things about yourself? Oh, God. Um, I hope deep, not. Deep question. 
And I quite too enough, early for this. Quite, quite <laughs> enough to deal with as it goes. Yeah. Um, I suppose. I suppose. I suppose. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. yeah. But it's very incremental, and it happens very slowly. I mean, it's you know things like I've got grandchildren now, and, and things like that inevitably change your perspective. They must love you. Having you sucks for a granddad is a great <laughs> idea. That's, a, that's fun. <laughs> They're hilarious. They're hilarious. <laughs> They're twins and they're just like lightning, you know. Brilliant. They're five or six years old and my girl Birdie is she's like an athlete. And she said to me the other day, she went, Granddad, have you noticed how slow the earthworms move? She was out in the garden. Yes. They move they move like like you when you're walking. <laughs> Excellent. Good stuff. From the mouths <laughs> mouth of innocent babes, that's it. All right, Suggs. So did you have odd jobs when you were young? Yeah, I had loads of them. My probably most interesting yeah. one, well, I was a life model for a little bit. I was a life model. What, what nude in the art club? <laughs> I spent a little bit of time down in Devon when I sort of ran yeah. out of money and yeah, I was doing bits. I started yeah. a, a Christmas tree removal business because I had a van for a bit before I crashed it. <laughs> good for you. Um, but yeah, I've always, good, good. I've always been kind of stuck in that oh. idea because I've always wanted to have a stable job and actually yeah. now's the most stable I've had because I started this and now I've kind of built yeah. my world. So ironically, talking about <laughs> not being able to find me a job has got me a job. It's got you a job. <laughs> and I found a job and heaven knows I'm miserable now. Exactly. Um, Brilliant. Nice one. All right, look, it's been really great to chat. Thanks for the time. Thank you, mate. Very welcome. So there was Suggs here on 101 Part Time Jobs. Very pleased that that happened. A great storyteller. That madness record with all the extra trimmings is coming out on the 3rd of June. Dear to the Absurd presents Sailor V, it's cool. Five extra studio recorded songs, seven live tracks, and you can see them on tour all across the UK and Ireland this summer. Cheers for listening. If you enjoyed this, make sure you subscribe to 101 Part-Time Jobs. We put out two episodes at least a week and we do all sorts of stuff. We've got a couple of live podcasts coming up in London. Follow us on the socials to find out more about that. Cheers for being here. Thanks to our sponsor, DistroKid. If you play in a band, you can put out your own records. Maybe you know someone who plays music, a cousin or a nephew or maybe even a colleague, and they don't know how to put out their own record. Well, DistroKid can help them there. Head to distrokid.com slash VIP slash 101 pod, and you can put your track out there so it gets on Apple and Spotify, TikTok, YouTube, all of it, and you make your own income from the royalties there. DistroKid is an easy, fun way to put your music out there. And as a 101 listener, you get 30% off your first year on DistroKid. Head to distrokid.com slash VIP slash 101 pod. One part-time jobs is hosted by Giles Bidder and produced by me, Olivia Swash. This has been a Mighty Moon Media production. Oh, 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 oh.